Here's one of the latest interviews from Rock and Metal Revival. If you want to hear the whole show, go to rmrshow.com. From one of my favorite albums that's out this year, Jerry, uh, that is Martyr from Last in Line on Rock and Metal Revival. And dude, since we got our hands on this... It's been in my freaking CD player all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm listening Yeah, to. we have not released it. I remember when uh, when uh, Vinny was on the show and he told us, kind of gave us a hint that this was going on. Yeah, it was like, oh, I can't wait to hear Viv back with his crunching guitar. <laughs> and we've got him on the show. We want to welcome Vivian Campbell to Rock and Metal Revival. Welcome, Viv. How's it going, guys? It's Good. going fantastic. Good. And uh, like we said, and we're not uh, sugarcoating anything, this album is just killer. Thank you very much. You know, it was um, it was a labor of love for us to do, and, and it's been an absolute pleasure to, to play with Jimmy and Vinny again. And <clears throat> as you know, I'm sure it, it's been a very bittersweet experience, the release of this record, because oh, Jimmy yeah. passed away a month before it came out. And I know that Jimmy really believed in it. Uh, to such extent, he went and got a tattoo with Last in Life. So, oh, man. You know, it was... Um, and and it, it's been a... Like I said, a bittersweet experience for us because we really, really enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed making this record so much and um, believe in it so much. And, uh, you know, it, it actually was ready to go a year ago, and we've been sitting on it for a year because we were waiting until we had an opportunity to go on tour to promote it mm -hmm. uh, because we believed in it that much. We just didn't want to just release it and have it wither on the vine. So um, it was particularly sad, you know, <clears throat> Jimmy passing away when he did, so. Anyway, but uh, at least, you know, Jimmy left us with a strong record. He really yeah, did. And, sure. and I guess the next question is, is uh, are you guys going to carry on now that Jimmy's gone? I mean, are we going to get a last in line tour or are we going to get a follow up CD? Is, has any of that been talked about? Well, we actually were scheduled to go on tour. Uh, we canceled the tour. It just didn't seem right at the time. Um, we have decided that we will honor a couple of the shows that we were scheduled to play, a couple of festival dates. One is uh, for our record company in Milan in Italy, and the other is the Rocklahoma Festival around Memorial Day weekend. Mm. Um, we'll do a couple of warm-up shows in advance of both of those also. Um, we just last week got together with um, a, an old friend of ours who's a very, very well-known bass player, and he's going to stand in <clears throat> for us because, um, you know, we we didn't feel it was right to just get someone to play bass and go out on tour. That wouldn't have been good to Jimmy's memory. But um, it's also taken us some time to just get our head around this. And, and we've decided that we owe it to Jimmy. We owe it to each other. We owe it to this record, you know, to, to do something with it. So baby steps for now you know we'll do those shows uh, and then i'll be back out on the road with leopard for the rest of the year so it, it's kind of a moot point um yeah. maybe at the end of 2016 we might consider gonna and, and doing a more comprehensive tour because the record has been very very well received you know so it, it would be good to do what we can with it um as far as making another album i i really don't know i mean it's it, it still would be very difficult to think about doing that without Jimmy, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. cause Jimmy was, was such a creative player. I mean, he was a great, great writer. He was a great creative energy. He would always keep things moving when you were in the rehearsal room coming up with song ideas. Jimmy would always come up with something, always, you know. So, um, And there was a great chemistry between Jimmy and Vinny and I, and it's going to be very, very difficult yeah. to to replicate that, you know. Yeah, sure. I, I know that when I first heard the album, the whole thing, when we, we got our copy, I could really feel that energy that you guys had back in the Dio recordings. Is is it just a chemistry between the three of you that comes out when you guys get together? That uh, I mean, it's it's unmistakable when 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 you hear that sound, you know it's you guys playing. Well, I I, I do believe in that kind of thing. I mean, I don't subscribe to the thought that you can just replace musicians mm -hmm. and have it be the same you know i mean we can all play somewhat like other people um you know and i say this from benefit of a lot of experience because i've been in a lot of bands and i've had had to step into a lot of shoes to cover yeah. you know and then for the last 24 years i've been playing with def leppard after steve clark passed away but i do not play like steve clark and i never will yeah. and i never did you know so it's that Def Leppard never sounded the same since I played with them. Um, you know, I, I do believe that, that we're all unique as musicians. You know, it's kind of like the fingerprint thing. You know, everyone has a unique fingerprint, and every musician plays differently. Like every guitar player, I can play 
Gary Murlich. <laughs> and believe me, I've spent many, many years trying to, <laughs> but I will never sound like Gary Moore, you yeah. know. And um, it's it's okay to be inspired by other musicians, but it, it's a, a fool's errand to try and emulate them, you know. Um, we all bring something different. Every player has, has a different physical way that they play their instrument, a different attack, a different passion, a different tonality, you know, and, and your tone as a guitar player is in your hands, much more so than what kind of guitar you're playing or what kind of amp or what effect pedal you have. That's what I you always know? say. That's it's a physical thing, yeah. you know, and, and no singer sounds the same and no drummer plays the same. Like like Vinny is such a unique drummer, you know, the the just the subtleties, it's the little nuanced things that, that make us all unique. And, and um, so there was a real chemistry with Jimmy and Vinny and I, and it was the undeniable sound of, of early Dio. You know, um, and that's why it, it'll never quite be the same now that Jimmy's gone. You know, which is why I don't, I can't say for certainty that we would make another record as last in line. I really, honestly, don't know. Hmm. Well, I really am glad that you're back with this kind of music because I love the way you play in your guitar solos. And um, I read that back in the day when you were doing the Dio Dio first album, you used to really stress about doing your guitar solos. About you know yeah. how they well, were going to come out. Well, that's all. That's because I, I don't go into the studio prepared. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. um, like you know, I've always been amazed when we're making Def Leppard records. When Phil steps in to do a solo, he knows exactly what he's going to do. Yeah, and I remember the first time I, I heard him do a solo in, in the studio, and I thought, "Wow, I said that was great." Did you just like did that just come out of you? And he said, "No, no, no." He said, I "Kind of, you know, I knew I was going to do this and then do that," and I'm thinking, "Wow." I should probably do that, but I've just never been that kind of player. I kind of rely a little bit too much on inspiration, and sometimes it works brilliantly, and mm -hmm. other times it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> so, you know, because here's the problem, guys, because the reason why I work that way, because the solo for Rainbow in the Dark was the very first solo that I recorded for the Holy Diver album. I love that solo. And the solo that's on the record is the very first take. Nice. It just kind of fell out. Um, and I thought, wow, this is the way you do guitar solos. You just don't know what you're doing, and you just play, and the first one's a keeper, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, from from that point on, it, it got to be um, a lot more difficult, you know. So so nowadays, when I do go into the studio to, to do a solo, I try and at least have something, somewhat of a roadmap. I, I very, very, very seldom know what I'm going to do um, to the full extent, but I, I usually have a bit of an idea what's what's going to happen you know you can't rely on inspiration alone yeah well you know I, when i when i first heard the cd v, viv i'm listening to it and i'm going there's viv right there there's that guitar sound dude with you've been in def leppard for 24 years do they not give you the input that you would get i mean i, I just don't hear that sound coming out of you with well, def leppard. you know because def leppard don't need that from me yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my gig in Leopard exercises a very different muscle to my gig in Last in Line. In Last in Line, I do not sing. I, I put my head down and I play guitar. Mm -hmm. And and it's very, very much a guitar challenge because I'm the only guitar player in the band and it's very guitar-oriented music mm -hmm. and uh, very riff-centric and, and there's a big guitar solo in every song that we do. Whereas with Leopard, the guitar solos are very concise, they're very short, they're very thematic, um, and there's two guitar players in the band, and the the real gig is about the singing. You know, obviously the rhythm guitar playing is, has to be very concise and very tight as well, and I do take great pride in trying to do that uh, to the best of my ability. And, um, you know, but but it's it's the vocals that's is, is the real challenge in Leopard. In every single song, we're all singing, and like really, really difficult parts. You know, so it, it's a different muscle. And, and when I play with Last in Line, it, it is a whole different thing. And it, it's a great release for me to actually get back and, and play guitar like that again. And, and I do miss it, to be honest, you know. So I, I kind of, I'm very, very fortunate in, in so much as I have the best of both worlds. You know, I get to exercise both muscles. I do love to sing as well. And through the years with Leopard, I've, I've become pretty good at it. But I don't want to sing in Last in Line. I just want to shut up and play guitar. Yeah. Well, we missed the way you've been playing, too. <laughs> well, well, thank you. You know, yeah. it, it's been very cathartic to get back to that. And, you know, it happened for a lot of reasons. As, as I've said many times in talking about the genesis of Last in Line, is that it all kind of grew out of my playing with Thin Lizzy for mm -hmm. a few months back in 2010, 2011. Um, 
you know, Scott Gorham called me up, and, and it was always going to be a temporary gig. You know, he knew I was committed to Def Leppard, but Leopard weren't busy at the time, and he asked me to go on tour in Europe with Lizzie, and uh, I jumped at the chance, because that was my youth, you know, and I was oh, really yeah. learning how to play guitar. I took so much from Thin Lizzy, and the Lizzy guitar players, Gorham and, and Robertson, and, and through my love of Thin Lizzy, I discovered Gary Moore, who was my ultimate guitar hero. Nice. And so just, you know, being on stage with, with Brian Downey and Scott Gorham and, and playing Emerald and Black Rose and all oh. the songs of my youth, it just it reignited that passion again, you know. So I, I came off of that tour, and that's when I called up Vinny and Jimmy, and, and we went into a room and just started playing. And and from that grew this idea to do some gigs, and from that grew the notion to actually write and record some new songs, you know, over the period of a couple of years. So, um, But, you know, it, it kind of came around that, and, and other things were going on, too. You know, I got my cancer diagnosis mm-hmm. in 2013, and... and Guitar was my first love, and, and I had a very troubled adolescence and teenage years, and, and I was totally devoted and committed to playing guitar. That's all I did with my time. Yeah. It was really socially awkward, and I would just lock myself in my room and play loud guitar. And, and But it saved my life at that time because my teenage years were a little bit troubled. you know. And then I kind of found myself dealing with cancer again, and... and the timing was right, you know. A guitar, for the second time in my life, has saved it, you know. Just rediscovering that passion, mm-hmm. you know, really kind of, it's my focus. It, it's what I'm good at, you know. So it, it's really nice to get back to it. Yeah. Well, you know, I Viv, I was, was such a big Dio fan, and, and, and I, I've always been a fan of Ronnie's. I thought the guy that had the toughest gig in Last in Line was Andrew. Yeah, uh, yep. I mean, how is he? T- how I mean, how has he stepped? I mean, his vocals are incredible. Great. Great. I yeah. mean, but I mean, that's a that's a tough that's a tough you know. Yeah, trying to fill shoes <laughs> trying to like fill, that. You know, I don't even think he's trying to fill his shoes. No, but, he's, no, know. no, he he's definitely not, and that would be wrong. Yeah, you know, and, and when we first kind of announced that we were going to do this, and people first heard Andrew, you know, so many people were approaching me through through my facebook page um saying why didn't you get so and so or this guy or that guy they sound like ronnie and that that's just totally 100 percent, completely missing the point you know ronnie ronnie like i said before every musician is unique and ronnie was was the most unique singer and and the best of the genre and it would just be shit to try and replace him you know you cannot replace musicians so the fact that andrew was a very very powerful singer but had this completely different tonality that's what first sparked the idea for me to to actually do some gigs because you had Vinny and jimmy and i when we play the unmistakable sound of early dio but you had this singer who was nothing like ronnie but very powerful and just it made it for a different thing and so Andrew was never trying to step into Ronnie's shoes, but there was always going to be people making that comparison for obvious reasons. Um, that's why I think it's great that we actually did get to the stage where we got to make an album of new material that are actually, you know, Andrew's songs, where people get to hear Andrew Freeman for what he really is, you know, as a great singer and a great writer and not someone doing a version of, of Ronnie's songs, you know. Um, so it, it, I'm sure it's a very, very big relief for Andrew that we've actually taken this step. And, and I think that, that he really, really, his performance on this record, his input to this record, um, not just as a singer, but as a writer and, and as a lyricist, I think it's just been immense. Nice. Well, I, I love the way he sings. And I love the way you play guitar. And being a guitarist myself, um, a lot of the things you, you've said so far like rings so true if as like the your tone comes from your hands more than it comes from your pedals and all that stuff and um i was wondering what do you what do you look for when you're gonna pick up a new guitar or some or at the shop at the guitar store or whatever i I don't know you know i sometimes cheap guitars sound grip because they just resonate more you know yeah um uh, you know those little cheap Dan electros or little Les Paul copies, yeah. But yeah. and and sometimes the real expensive ones, like the five thousand dollar Les Paul, sometimes they're not that great. You know, yeah. it's like so. I I would never take price as a guide for a guitar, and and I actually do prefer used instruments. Yeah. Um, you know, Rory Gallagher was my first guitar hero. He mm-hmm. was the, the first concert mm-hmm. I saw. The first album I owned was Rory Live in Europe '72. Oh. Um, so. That, you know, Rory had played a beat-up Strat that had practically no paint in it, and it was all rusted and scraped yeah. and whatnot. And, and that kind of 
that's the way I like my guitars. I like patina on them, you know. Uh, when I first bought a Les Paul, um, I actually took it home from the music store that night and I took sandpaper to it <laughs> and I buffed off the finish because I couldn't stand having a shiny guitar, you know. And yeah. then I proceeded to modify every single aspect of that guitar and I still have that guitar. That's actually the, the first Les Paul I owned and uh, the one that I wrote and recorded and toured the Holy Diver album with. Oh, and, nice. and actually I did this last in line album with it too. And, um I haven't played it for decades. It's been in storage, and I, I took it out when I started playing with Jimmy and Vinny again. It just seemed fitting that I go back mm-hmm. to use the actual guitar that we did Holy Diver with. So, you know, and it's not the best Les Paul I own, not by a long shot, but it's obviously there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Mm-hmm. Character. Uh, you know, imbued in that instrument, so mm-hmm. it means a lot to me. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, used guitars. You know, my, my second favorite Les Paul, and the one I use primarily with Def Leppard, is a bastardized guitar, but the, it started as a 78 Custom that I bought for 400 bucks in a pawn shop in Nashville in 1992, you know, because I loved the neck of it. Uh, it ended up getting run over at an airport and got, uh, the body was, was trashed. So, but I did manage to, to salvage the, the neck and the headstock and the front pickup, and then I rebuilt it around that. But wow. the neck was the important thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes used guitars are great. There's a lot of history in them already, you know. Yeah, they're worn in and, yeah. Exactly. Hey, Viv, now, of all the D.O. stuff you did, is there one that uh, has a special place for you, which uh, your favorite, the one you're most proud of? Well, it's got to be between the first two albums, Holy Diver and Last in Line. Um, that's when the band was really uh, in sync with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, by the time we got to the third album, Sacred Heart, the, the wheels were starting to fall off in in many ways. Um, we kind of lost our direction on that, and we started using keyboards a lot more in the writing process. The arrangements became more complicated, uh, unnecessarily so, some of us felt. Um, and, and Ronnie was in a really dark place. He had just separated from <clears throat> his wife and the band's manager, and, and so it didn't didn't set a good tone for, for making that record. Um, but yeah, the Holy Diver album and the Last in Line album, God, between the two of them, they were so easy to make. You know, there was a real camaraderie in the band. Everyone was working towards a common goal. We all really believed in what we were doing. Um, pretty much the, exactly the same way that we felt when we were doing this Heavy Crown album, you know. That's why I wanted to bring it back to that place where we started with Holy Diver, um, without keyboards, guitar, bass, drums, vocal, Excellent. which was the way we wrote and recorded the Holy Diver album. Um, it, it's hard to pull a favorite track, to be honest, Um but if you had to narrow it down to just one, I would take the actual song, Last in Line, the title track from the second album. Good tune. Um, which yeah. is one of the reasons also why I named this band Last in Line. That's um, awesome. Because yeah. that really solidified what we were all about. Um, that song is very, very much a co-write. Um, I had the intro written and the actual main riff. Jimmy came up with a little uh, verse part. Then he came up with the arrangement for the middle Ronnie, of course, came up with the lyric and the melody. Um, it was very, very much a, a team effort, and it really, um, it was the song that made it possible for us to do the second album. Um, once we had written that song, I remember the night that it all came together. Uh, the next day, Ronnie booked the studio. Even though we hadn't written the rest of the album, he knew that we had the the centerpiece for the album. We had the main thing, the title track, the epic song and the record, and that the rest would just fall into place, which it did. You know, so so that was a very special song. That's awesome. Now I got one more guitar question. Do you think um, talk box the talk box isn't used enough anymore? <laughs> you know, I was never a fan of it. <laughs> um, I, I can see. You know, I love Wawa. Yeah. And I, you know, it's kind of like doing Wawa with your mouth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, it, it's the one thing I never kind of wanted to have. Like when I was a, a guitar kid, you know, every birthday, every Christmas, whatever, I'd be badgering my parents to buy me a fuzz pedal or a wah pedal, uh, yeah. you know, overdrive pedal or a phaser or a chorus pedal or a delay pedal or something like that. Um, but the talk box was never <laughs> on, on my wish list. You're never gonna so do I'm going to go with no. The, the Frampton comes alive again. You're not no. going to go there. Well, yeah. Viv, where's a great place for your fans to keep up with you and Last in Line and what's going on with you guys? Um, I'm pretty active on my Facebook page. I haven't been for the last couple of months since Jimmy passed away, um, but I'll get back to it. Um, you know, and I do interact with people on that. So if people want to actually get 
in touch with me personally, that's the place to do it. Um, so it's Vivian Campbell Official, I think. I should probably know these things, but I don't. <laughs> um, and Last in Line, yeah, Last in Line Official is the Last in Line website. And, and we also kind of, Andy and Vinny and myself are, are reasonably active on the Last in Line Facebook page. Um, I don't do Twitter. I don't blame no, you. No, I'm not. I'm on no. it, but I don't use it. Yeah, I don't understand. yeah, yeah. You know, it's hard. You you really end up devoting a lot of your life to social media sometimes. So yeah. yeah, every now and again, it's nice to take a break, get away. Yeah. Hiatus. Well, we're gonna play another track off the last in line, and this is really hard to choose. But we let you choose, and you pick Star Maker. What's the uh, significance with that tune? Um, you know, I just think it's a great song. It's an epic song. It and it sounds like it. it like several of the songs in this record, it 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 sounds like an era. It like it could have been in the seventies or the mm-hmm. early eighties when rock was king, you know. And when when Vinny and Jimmy and I were kicking around ideas for riffs, you know, that's very typical of the sort of thing that we would write. You know, that's the style. So I really do think that that song embodies a lot of what the band Last in Line is about, and. Um, it also just has massively great Jimmy being bass tone in the verses. Nice. You know, the verses are very empty, and you can hear just what a great, toneful bass player Jimmy was. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Well, Vivian Campbell, it has been an honor for us to have you on Rock and Metal Revival, and you are welcome here anytime. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. To catch the whole show of Rock and Metal Revival, all you have to do is check it out on these affiliates. Mega Rock Radios on Saturdays from 11 a.m. Eastern Time and on Uncontrolled Noise Tuesdays at 1 a.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and on Saturday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern on uncontrollednoise.com. And make sure that you leave them a message and tell them that you found Rock and Metal Revival on their stations. Enjoy this edition of Rock and Metal Revival. 